I will need your help in defining what is next. Uh, I'm Jos van Beurde. I've been studying the illicit trade in art and antiquity since uh, the beginning of the 1990s. I've traveled a little bit for it. And um, initially I was studying the ongoing trade and smuggling of art and antiquities. But I remember that, in fact, during my first visit to Mali in West Africa in 1991, I discussed with the National Museum about the issue and discovered that, in fact, there was a continuity between the massive migration of objects during colonialism and after independence. So not much has changed. Only the actors and the names of the actors had changed. Um, so I wrote a few books about it, but the last book, that's this one, Treasures in Trusted Hands, it's about colonial objects and restitution issues. And I did it purposely because for, say, for the ongoing trade in art and antiquities, there are some regulations like the UNESCO 1970 Convention. There are implementation laws. For Nazi looted art, I discovered there are principles have been defined very important. So I've decided to focus on colonial objects and restitution issues. Um, and I have titled my contribution Looking for Common Ground because I think I feel that's what we need, but I will try to define that. Um, first of all, at the global level, there are changing power relations. New ethics are arising, as we have seen during this conference, and the presence of migrants make they, these three factors. They make that what European colonial powers once considered as a major gain is becoming a burden for museums and collectors in the continent. Europe has a problem, a big problem, especially in relation of war booty, of confiscated and smuggled objects, confiscated by, by missionaries, by scientists, by collectors, and smuggled objects by colonial officials and military. And whereas uh, Wayne said yesterday is a pessimist with a little bit of hope, I'm more of an optimist, but I try to limit my hope as much as possible, you know, just to be realistic. I think there are cautious indications of a break in the 2002 declaration on the importance and value of universal museums. You all know about it. And I see developments in, in Germany, in Scandinavia, in the Netherlands. I see, for instance, I don't think it has been mentioned already, but two months ago, for the non-Dutch among you, two months ago, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, they announced that it will start in-depth investigation of 10 colonial objects and with the ultimate consequence that they might have to be returned. This museum is, doing, uh, is in the process of a repatriation project of some 1,500 objects to Indonesia. But I have to add, you know, basically it's a superfluous collection of 15,000, and the Indonesians, they have accepted of it only 10%. So that also see Europe has a problem. Um, in, we have had the, um, the quotation, the, the news by Macron, and I've written down the English text for those of you who do not read France, French. And, uh, but I also listened to, to the speech itself. And in the speech, he didn't say only France, but also Europe. He did not only say museums, but also private collections. I think the private collections are also very important for colonial objects. Next week, in, in Belgium, a network will be set up of museum curators and scientists to discuss the future of colonial objects. So there are some positive elements, I think, you know. But at the same time, you see that so far most former colonial powers and the museums, they have more talked about returns than that they have returned objects. The result is very meager. And there's one big problem coming up, and you see that also in other discussions in the Netherlands about slavery, about colonialism, and so how do we prevent that, you know, that we start to polarize? I think it's a very important issue, and I wonder whether you have thoughts about, you know, how we can discipline ourselves to be very, 
very much to the point in the discussion about it. And uh, I have to look myself in the mirror because I can get very upset about things, about injustice. But we have to do, to do that in a very disciplined way in order to prevent polarization. And that was also one of the themes, for instance, in the, in the guest book in, in Berlin, but also in other lectures. Now, how do we proceed? Return is a healing process. It's a means to undo injustice. It's a means to improve relations and to make them more sustainable. Return is also the transfer of objects. Now, from, from the study, I've learned that no two returns are identical or return processes, but that you probably all know. And do not try to make it a quick fix because you're cheating yourself. It's too difficult to claim. You need time and you need experts to do with it. Now, so far in the, say, immediate, in the post-independence period, claims you know, that were dealt with, they were usually matters between two states. But more and more, also under the influence of um, indigenous communities and other discussions, you see that more and more non-state actors want to be involved in the discussions about it. And, and we have to think about it, how to involve them. There's another thing that, you know, I think there are important lessons to be learned from how, deal how we have been dealing with disputes about Nazi looted art and even about colonial human remains and funerary objects. And in the, I was looking for the common ground and this is where I need, will need your help. In the present transitional phase, we can just find more common ground, that's, that's what I've learned, if we find a set of principles that can guide us and it's a set of principles at the European level. We need a set of principles that can guide us in investigating our own collections, solving our own European problem, and dealing with claims with former col colonies. And what I did for that is I compared these dealings with Nazi looted art with dealings with colonial objects. And of course, I mean, both are based on historical injustice, and we have to do something with that. And there is an incredible difference between those two categories of contestable art. You know, it's time span. I have to ex don't have to explain who owns an object. Very complicated question. And the evidence is also complicated. But what I did do, and that's my what next answer to the question, what next, but I need your help to think about it. What I did is I translated the 1998 Washington Conference Principles for Dealing with Nazi Confiscated Art into principles on objects of cultural or historical importance taken without just compensation or involuntary loss in the European colonial era. Now you see from the definition already how complicated it is to, to translate only the title of these principles in a suitable title for colonial objects. And this is what I've tried to done it. So I couldn't say conf confiscated because then you get immediately the problem of, yeah, but it was Dutch territory or British territory. So we were allowed to confiscate. But if you say t taken without just compensation or involuntary loss, that's a category which helps much better. And, the, the def and that comes also back in the definition. You know, in, in the first part, if you look at the, the Washington principles, I've got one more minute. Okay, I'll, I'll finish that. Yep. You, know, you see that, uh, well, I'll go then to the fourth principle. We have to, consideration should be given to unavoidable gaps or ambiguities in the provenance in the light of passage of time and the circumstances of the um, European colonial era. So I'm asking you, uh, you, if you have any reflections of this, they're absolutely welcome. And... You know, we just have to go to fair and just solutions. My time is over. Thank you very much. Yeah, just a few words. Uh, my name is Marens Engelhardt. I'm a national archivist. I, I'm really, uh, really honored to, to be here. And also, I feel a little bit like they say in Dutch, a strange duck in the pond. Because I'm an archivist, and I have never really dealt with musea. 
Um, but of course, what we have deals with history as well, but in a slightly different way. And well, I learned a lot today and, you know, learned a lot of new questions also. I'd uh, like to say a few words about the nature of archives and, well, perhaps how it relates. Archives are always dealing with power because they are the remnants, well, the, the remains of uh, power structures. And whoever has the power decides what is going to remain. So archives are always a reflection of, well, you can say the establishment. And archivists are the curators of that, and they make choices. So archivists are quite invisible, mostly. But of course, they determine, to a large extent, what's being shown to you and to the next generations of documentary uh, well, heritage. So they are not no neutral, although it's hard to see. Uh, for, for this reason, archives are also, also very often an object of violence and war even. I mean, one of the first things which was struck in Sarajevo when the city was beleaguered was the Oriental Institute, which, well, had the documentary history of the uh, Bosnian uh, Muslims. And the example of Timbuktu was mentioned also today, where all the documentary heritage, heritage had to be removed, which succeeded, actually. Now, if we talk about or think about decolonizing the archives, which we are doing, we, we hosted a seminar on the uh, East Indian Company uh, the other week in uh, The Hague, uh, where also the concept of decolonizing was uh, discussed. Um, there's a difficulty. The principle of provenance, as archivists call it, is kind of a holy principle, which means the place of origin should be kept intact, but also the original order because otherwise you cannot use an archives to reconstruct the context and to understand how it is formed. So giving back archives or changing archives, I mean, goes contrary to the principle of provenance. But that does not mean that if archives have been removed from their original place where they have been formed, they should not be returned. And that's actually what we have done quite recently. But in another way than Catherine Liu just described, and I'd like to go into that. We returned earlier this year, after an almost 10-year project, all the original archives which were formed in Suriname. Um, this was quite important to the Suriname research community, but the Dutch government posed a number of conditions. So it was not like uh, what uh, Mrs. Liu said, well, it's not yours, so just give it back, and then it's up to them what to do with it. No, we posed some conditions, a new archival building, new archival law, some training programs, and then it was returned after digitization. And also digitization is, is a, a, a concept which you can dispute. Digitization provides worldwide access, of course, online to archives, but at the same time, it lures away researchers from some places where they would have visited otherwise. So on one hand, it would be a very easy solution to, you know, to provide access to anybody who's interested. At the same time, some countries who have archives, which, uh, well, we want to digitize, say, well, don't di digitize them because we want to be part of the research community and they're not going to visit us anymore. So it's all not that easy. Just to conclude, because of the time, because I'm really actually inspired by this day to, to say more about it, but I won't perhaps later on. Um, the question uh, which Wayne posed is, well, how do you act then? Um, what we try to do is have educational programs in which we teach um, primary school students to, to realize what historical sources are and how they can use them for, well, the interpretation of their own past, which is a kind of very basic education of well, self-reliance, how you can search out uh, sources. But of course, that's not neutral either. So we try to, we are in the process very, you know, in the early process of trying to uh, interact with other communities in the Netherlands to advise us and to guide us a little bit how we can do that in a well multi-perspective uh, way. Same goes for our expo expositions. We have this uh, East Indian Company exposition at this time, and uh, it was prepared uh, already three years ago, and what we could wait for, I, I expected it to happen, was that it drew a lot of commentaries from, well, you know, different perspectives in the Netherlands, which was um, sometimes a little bit embarrassing, 
but it was not completely uh, unexpected. And the best thing to do was to react on it by you know, welcoming the commentaries and entering into the discussion and try to learn from it. So that's basically what we try to do. There, just, just, just one more remark. One thing which is a bit more fundamental, but it takes a lot of time, like the things they are doing in the Rex Museum, changing the, eh, the, the text with the paintings. With archives, that's difficult, because the descriptions of archives are part of the historical well, documents, and if you would change that, you change the value of the history. But you can, what you can do is add another layer. But that takes a long time, and we have to think about how we can do that. Thank you. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about an exhibition I just opened at the Welt Museum in Vienna. Um, but uh, before I do that, I want to say that I feel an urgent and an emotional connection to the thematics that are being discussed here at this conference. And part of the reason for that um, urgency and um, sense of heavy emotions um, comes out of my role as an artist who has been working for almost 20 years now um, on the legacies of colonial visuality. Um, and for me, I cannot talk about the frame of colonialism without also talking about trauma. And trauma is something that resides in the body. And you, so the body, where it exists within the museum, where it exists in the archive, is of central importance to me and in my work. Um, and so, as Wayne mentioned, I was part of the SWITCH project, which began as a residency where I had a lot of misgivings about what it meant to work in an ethnographic museum. Um, would I be um, a native informant? Would I be a neoliberal cheerleader, um, as many artists are being asked to do? Um, and also, in particular, I think in relation to anthropological museums and ethnographic museums, artists of color are often invited in to, I think, lessen white institutional guilt um, and um, somehow give a kind of blessing, like, you are okay now. Um, to the credit of the museum, I would say that they didn't interfere with my process of being um, in residence there and taking my time to construct an exhibition. Um, but on the other hand, I feel, I have to say, a deep sense of um, unease, grief, anger, when I encounter something like the trophy skull that's being exhibited, even with the knowledge that there was community consent, because what Catherine's lovely um, presentation today um, enlightened for me, it helped me name my discomfort. Um, because what is the nature of consent when the power relationships are so deeply unequal? So what does that consent mean um, that the museum, um, which holds so much power, um, what, yeah, so what does that mean? Um, and with that, I'm just going to show you some of my work and, and I think some of the thematics that I'm exploring, because I'm trying to disturb uh, colonial visualities. Um, I'm not trying to erase what came before, but rather enter into some kind of dialogue. Um, so I, I, I titled my exhibition, Staying with Trouble. Uh, this is borrowed from an early paper given by Donna Haraway, um, where she asked a set of questions. What does it mean to think, act, and write in an age of extermination? Um, what is the work of recovery? And then what is, um, what is, yeah, what is the, what is the work of uh, recuperation? Um, and her answer was staying with trouble. And for me, to stay in the middle of the contradiction is what I'm, I'm often trying to do as an artist. And I think what it means to be in an ethnographic museum, there is no getting away from the violence that is in the foundations of an institution like an ethnographic museum or like the Welt Museum or this one. Um, but one can engage those meanings and maybe produce something new and productive from that. Um, but you're always implicated in it. Um, okay, oh, let's see. And then. So I'm going to um, just start. Uh, the center of my exhibition is really the deconstruction of a 1902 German textbook called Die Boker der Erde. Um, and it is a book that I cut apart and then 
used as a kind of generative sketchbook um, source for all the ideas that came out in the exhibition. And I'll go rather quickly, um, but just to give you an idea, um, this is kind of an individual detail of what became a 70-page um, installation. And um, so these are just, uh, so book pages. Um, we'll have another view of the overall installation in a second. But a lot of it is like, um, some of the works are better than others. It's, the point is not about them as individual works, but really seeing the total gesture of um, cutting apart the book. Um, and then for me, it's about a very, um, uh, it's not premeditated, my interventions. They're, they're very, uh, so this is a, a view of what the installation overall looks like. So you can see some pages better than others. You see it sort of more as a collective act. And from this book, um, I, there are also um, another set of projects. Uh, oh, there's two vitrines in the space, um, kind of antique museum vitrines. And uh, one set has a set of watercolors that I created. And these watercolors are based on um, photographs from the museum's photo archive, which is a very neglected set, a part of the museum. Um, it ha there's, I, I think there's been virtually no historical scholarship on its photographic collection. Uh, the main emphasis, I think, for the museum, what I was told, is that is on the objects. Um, so I kind of reinterpreted the photographs through painting um, and then uh, through surrealism. These are um, just examples. There are eight watercolors in one vitrine. Uh, just kind of an installation view. And then the next project um, the, is also a vitrine, it's based in vitrine, and some of you will recognize. Um, this is the first, uh, on the left is Fritz Rock, the first uh, director of the Welt Museum. Um, and on the right is Stephen Engelsman, who's here. Uh, I didn't know that you're going to be here, um, but I, 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 I decided to include yours. There's five portraits that I created of scientists and directors associated with the Welt Museum. And for me, it was like also part of the gesture of um, bringing those that uh, the the knowledge producers into in front of the lens. Um, and also then I think this uh, act of um, adding the facial tattoo, uh, Fritz Rock was a Nazi sympathizer, and uh, it, it was like adding these kinds of, uh, th this gesture was about bringing also something about um, pathologizing the white male subject. <clears throat> and it's a vitrine um, layout, just an installation view. And then the last um, set of works that I'll show you are a new set of portraits that are very um, personally important to me. Do I have enough time? Yeah? yeah. Oh, a few, a few minutes, okay. Um, so this is uh, from a series called Do You, uh, Do you Know Our Names? Um, these come from anthropological portraiture uh, from actually the same book that I deconstructed, Die Voker der Erde. Um, there, are, there were small, very brutal images of um, native women uh, from different parts of the world without clothing, without hair, set into blocks of text. And um, I uh, took uh, these uh, images, re reproduced them photographically, digitally, um, and then set, uh, they're about 70 by 100 centimeters, but I set about um, an act for me which is about recuperation of identity, of um, it's about kind of, um, yeah, so I, I, I give them makeup, I give them hair, I give them clothing, and in the process, for me, it's a deeply joyful project to do, um, uh, and so I'll just show you a few of these, and then we can, I'll end. And the, I'll just mention that the title, Do You Know Our Names, comes from the lyric of a Sweet Honey in the Rock song um, called, if, uh, uh, God, now I'm blanking on the name, If You Had Lived, I think. Um, but it was also, their music was very central to the making of these portraits. I would, it would be the first thing that I would play to kind of set the spiritual and political tone for the project for me. And then there's just two more images I'll show. These two are actually not at the Welt Museum, but are in Berlin right now at, um, at Gallery im Corner Park.
part of a show on gender and colonial, col colonialism. And that's the last image. And I think that's probably 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, my uh, sort of small talk today is called um, The Museum Will Not Be Decolonized. Um, and it's basically based on my experiences at uh, Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery as part of a team of co curators. Um, we were basically invited in and asked to um, curate an exhibition which confronts Birmingham's imperial history using the museum's existing collections. So here we go. Um, so firstly, I need to say that um, Birmingham is a divided city, like most cities, um, and that these divisions stem um, in all kinds of ways from colonial rule. Birmingham was the factory of empire, the site of the Industrial Revolution, which was funded by the work of enslaved people um, on the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. Um, Birmingham produced Britain's metalworks, its guns, it gave the world the word eugenics, um, and its most celebrated figure is Joseph Chamberlain, um, who was a colonial secretary and a committed racist imperialist. <laughs> um, today, nearly 50% of Birmingham's population are not white, and it's not a coincidence that Birmingham has a very significant far right and white nationalist presence. Um, yeah? Okay, cool. That's fine. Um, Personally, um, I see in Birmingham's history and its present an opportunity to radically recast the role of the museum within public life. Instead of upholding hegemonic narratives of national identity, the museum could have a role in transforming it. Um, we were in a pretty good position because all of the co-curators um, of the past is now um, are women of colour from diverse heritages and therefore different experiences of empire. Um, and some of us have been involved in decolonial projects outside of the museum and we could see the potential gains of such an exhibition. <coughs> So we started out full of hope. We just a touch of anxiety that comes with being a non-white person within the institutional space. And in case you're wondering, yes, that is foreshadowing. Um, to me, there are two key stages to the co-curation process, or what happened. Um, the first was the kind of surface level, which was decolonizing the collection. So thinking about um, how museum objects could be contextualized in a decolonial way, providing context, um, changing the way we tell stories. Um, but the second was decolonizing the museum, and to me that is experiencing the resistance of institutional change as a kind of white wall, um, an emotional sort of experience, I would argue. Um, but yeah, so today I want to focus on the challenges of the co-curation process, um, the relationships that were built and broken during this project. Um, and if there are any questions about the specifics of the exhibition, I'd be happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, so firstly to say, um, at the start of the project, it was agreed that we would be paid an honorarium um, for the work that we were doing. Uh, for the museum, this was an innovative practice. Usually, um, they would just do a call for volunteers. Um, most of us are freelancers, so accepting a small fixed fee for the high-level consultancy that we were providing was something most of us were very uncomfortable with. It didn't feel very decolonial. Um, the co-curation itself comprised of several meetings. We were shown the permanent collections and asked to critique the neutral museum tone. We toured the museum storage spaces. We were given talks about how the museum's collections historic historically categorised peoples and nations. And we were asked to reflect upon traumatic histories, which we have all benefited from to varying degrees. Without fully realising it, um, they were providing a map of how the museum institutionalised a nation's forgetfulness. A history in which the colonizers is dehumanized, where certain objects are neatly accounted for, providing interesting and educational ways into a history for the majority white audience. So very quickly it became clear that the museum and ourselves um, went into the project with different expectations. To me, contextualizing an object or narrating history from the perspective of the colonized is just the surface level of decolonizing. The deeper work is thinking about how museums are complicit until today. Um, and to think about how you know, museums are resistant to change um, because to interrogate their existence would require awkward conversations about their continued preservation and protection of whiteness. If history is forgetfulness, then the fantasy of whiteness is what remains. This impacts the kinds of narratives that can be told. White, white neutrality must remain unquestioned and white people's feelings must be protected. At the moment, white people want to be berated about their colonial history, so in a funny kind of way, it's business as usual. Um, so, museum staff were aware of what decolonizing meant in relation to the collections, but I don't think they were prepared for us in practice. 
We were intent on drawing attention to the museum um, as an imperial structure that is intimately tied to systemic whiteness. We also strove to highlight how individuals reproduced institutions. In meetings, we would throw out phrases like white fragility and systemic racism to staff who had probably never been confronted in this way. Um, <laughs> and so um, we were allowed creative freedom within the exhibition, but it often felt like, it, like the price of our honesty was to jeopardise future decolonial projects and also our relationships with the curators. Um, we were never really sure where we stood. At the same time, we kind of were aware of what was happening because we all have experiences of kind of racism and we have a certain amount of empathy because exceeding privilege is painful. Um, we were asking the curators to question not only their professional practices, but to be involved in a conversation about their personhood within Birmingham, their responsibilities to us as people. Um, so there were several flashpoints, issues to do design components, certain key decisions that we weren't privy to at meetings that we were excluded from. But the main battle between us and the curators was the interpretation. To give a bit of context, um, by this time the project had run on significantly longer than planned and our involvement was much greater than what we had initially agreed upon. At first we made it clear that we did not want to write the interpretation. We had spent hours educating and facilitating a decolonial lens and we felt that if we were to write the interpretation it would compromise our values and professional integrity. Unfortunately, when we received the museum's interpretation, it was written in a neutral museum tone we had critiqued weeks earlier. We received the interpretation on a Friday and told the deadline for editing was Monday. Of course, we had no choice. We decided to meet on Monday and make it work. We sat in a room for eight hours on top of the work we'd already done individually over the weekend. We wrote the entire interpretation on that day. It was one of the toughest work days of my life and of course unpaid. We had to set aside questions like, am I being exploited? Would a white man accept this? And what about self-care? So that we could decolonize. Uh, we, we spent hours arguing about the wording and grammar. What would, what would be added to the story and what we would leave out? All the while concerned that our efforts might not be accepted and that our passion might be edited away. It was in this room that I realized that we had not been given any time alone whilst working with the museum. We were never able to talk between ourselves to actually have difficult conversations between co-curators and actually curate an exhibition. The process was museum-centred and focused on us teaching and training in the museum. We were centering white people's involvement in education. If we had, had time, time and resources for these conversations earlier, in a way that centred people of colour talking to one another, it would have been a very different project. In conclusion, um, I'm worried that your desire to collect decoloniality comes from the same place as when you displayed brown and black bodies as part of Empire's collection. When projects and institutions claim commitment to diversity, to inclusion, or to decoloniality, we need to attend to these claims with a critical eye. I do not want to see decolonization become part of um, a national narrative, a pretty curio with no substance, or worse for decoloniality to be claimed as yet another great accomplishment by Britain and other colonial powers. To, to decolonise the museum, a process must be put in place which is long-lasting and adequately funded. The museum must be committed to and dedicating, not to exhibiting a different perspective, but to embrace its colonial identity and then will its own destruction. Then we need to reimagine the museum as a radical space, and what that looks like is yet to be imagined. That's, that's it. So my uh, presentation was gold. Um, this is my new best friend, <laughs> without any doubt. Um, so I'm part of... I'm the, jealous, by the way. I thought I was the best friend. No, but you're the best friend forever. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, for sure. Uh, anybody, any questions about my friendships with... Okay. Um, I think some very interesting points have been made. I wrote some of them down. Um, with regards to the first presentation, um, how do you prevent us from polarizing. That was one of the questions I feel. But I feel that polarizing isn't the result of a lack of discipline by those who rebel or revolt or reject at least. Um, so I think it's a question that's difficult to answer because then you would pause change because you are afraid of the outcome um, of the person who doesn't want to change. And I feel that we, that's a conversation I really want to have today um, looking at the protests that are going on tomorrow also. So tomorrow, for those of us who are not part of the Netherlands, um, some activists, I hope a large group of activists, will go to a, a small village, let me call it a village, in the north of the Netherlands, um, 
protesting against blackface in the Netherlands. And some of us are very fearful that right-wingers, um, extreme as they might be, uh, what they would do. So, but then if we would take into account polarization, that means that we would have a different method of fighting for our humanities. So what does it mean then to ask the question of how do we prevent polarization, instead of asking how do we make the other side more aware of your humanity? And I think maybe that's something we can discuss, all of us. Um, very interesting point. Archives always deal with power and remains of colonial structures. I think that's right, because you collect something from a specific point of view. So I think we often consider archives to be neutral, as if we consider museums to be neutral, like these neutral spaces where you just go in and you hear one story. Um, but histories are never told from a neutral perspective, because history was never a really neutral place. The only thing that was neutralized was the opposition of people who weren't considered to be humans, basically. So that's something I would also like to discuss later on. Um, I can just reread your entire presentation and say, this is awesome. Um, and people being hired to lessen institutional guilt, I had, this is being recorded, right? What is it being broadcasted? <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, well, <laughs> Sorry. in recent histories, um, somebody invited me and a few other people to do a presentation, and it was a room like people like you, a uh, very mixed crowd, very like radical, radical space, and in that crowd, the person says, oh, this is amazing, like, we should talk about decolonial practices, and the person was all for it, until we had a meeting with the staff, and then we talked about decolonial practices, and she basically said, well, I don't see color, and race is very important. I was like, oh, this is interesting, because yesterday, in a different crowd, you had a different stance. So what does it mean when um, inviting the decolonial or radical artists on board becomes performative? So you do it to not lose relevance, and you do it to not be uh, the one who's not speaking about it. But when the doors close, exactly what Wayne also asked, like, you can have a museum that is, uh, that's having an exhibition about why it's important to be against what people, because that's the conversation we're having now. So what happens if the person then goes home and still puts on blackface? One of the curators in the team. So competition is to be had, I think. <laughs>